So today is the 7th of April, 2021. We've come together to chant the recollection of the Buddha, the recollection of the Dhamma, the recollection of the Sangha. And this Buddha Dhamma Sangha, this is our true refuge that we recollect. And when we chant, we offer our bodies and lives to the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. And this respect of the triple gem is the highest blessing in our life. We see that the Buddha taught the Mangala Sutta, the Mangala Sutta, the discourse on the highest blessings. Sevana jabalanang panditanancha sevana puja japujaniyanang etang mangalang uttamam, avoiding those of foolish ways, associating with the wise and honoring those worthy of honor. These are the highest blessings. So we see that these beginning verses of the Mangala Sutta um, talk about meeting with the fool, meeting with the wise person, and paying respect to those worthy of respect. And these are the highest blessings in our lives. We see that this term uh, fool or a uh, Balanang. This is some. This is a being that's not uh, beautiful, that one without uh, virtue in their hearts. This is an individual that invites us to do unwholesome things, things that cause us to uh, go on a bad path or to lose out in life, such as uh, drinking or gambling, uh, going out late, engaging in various paths of ruin leading our lives to not be at ease, our minds not to be at ease. So this uh, bala, this fool, we have to be careful because sometimes it's our own heart, our own mind that's the fool. We may think in an unwholesome way, in an unskillful way, and then we invite others to come do unskillful things or others may invite us to do unskillful things, to go on the bad path. We also meet with wise beings, with uh, Pandita, and this is uh, something important. And the most important is for our own hearts to be wise, to be established in virtue, in giving, in meditation. And whether it's our own heart or another person, the wise being invites others to do goodness and skillful actions along with them. And a wise being has a mind uh, with faith firmly established. And meeting with a wise being, our faith uh, increases and becomes even more firm. This is a faith in goodness, in generosity, virtue, and meditation. And associating with the wise, our understanding of the Dhamma increases more and more. And so these wise beings are a refuge in our lives. So we respect the Buddha Dhamma Sangha as our highest refuge. There's nothing higher in the world. We see that the Buddha as our refuge, the Buddha knew for himself uh, the truth of the way things are. is one who taught the Dhamma well, taught it, thoroughly and completely, and taught the way to freedom for all beings. Taught the path of uh, cutting off the unwholesome, doing the wholesome, making the mind pure. And this Dhamma that the Buddha taught, this is correct. This is the way to realize freedom from suffering. This path of virtue, concentration, and wisdom is the best way. So we follow the Dhamma of the Buddha in our hearts. We contemplate and incline our minds uh, to the Dhamma. We practice the Dhamma. We practice to cut off clinging and attachment. And to cut off this clinging, we need wisdom. We can't just cut off clinging uh, straight away just because we want to. When the six senses come into contact, uh, with their various objects, 
with the ear with sounds, the nose with smells, the tongue with tastes, the eye with visual forms, the body with uh, feeling, and the mind with mind objects. We practice to see this in the present moment. And sometimes the mindfulness is too slow. And then the mind clings to these sense impressions. Uh, but don't worry about this. Just uh, keep practicing with patient endurance and with mindfulness. Be intent, be determined in this practice and don't give up. Don't stop, just keep going. And this ability to not cling is up to our wisdom. So we see that all sense objects are just that, just sense objects. And if we have a lot of wisdom, then we're able to separate the, the mind from the sense objects and not cling to them. However, if there's only a little bit of wisdom, then we do cling to the sense objects. We can see if there's a 20 kilogram weight, as an adult, one can lift this very easily. However, a child, can't lift it at all. So we see that our ability to not cling is up to the energy, up to our strength of mind. This is an important point. And we see that this uh, ditti, the view, and mana, uh, conceit, the conceit of I am, this is something that we all have. These views and conceit are something that all beings have. In conceit, this mana has nine types. We, if we're better and we think that we're better, this is the first type. If we're better and think that we're the same, that's the second type. If we're better and we think that we're, that we're worse, then this is the third type. And we cling to all these three types of conceit. And if we're the same and we think we're better, or we're the same and we think we're the same, we're the same and we think we're worse. This is another three types. And if we're uh, worse or lower and we think that we're better and we're lower and we think we're the same and we're lower and we think that we're lower, then this is another three types of conceit. So we see these add up to nine types of conceit. And this conceit is again, something that all beings have in common. All individuals have this conceit it's not only oneself that has this conceit and others don't. We see our own conceit and we may think that others have no conceit or we have more than others, but it's really all beings have this conceit of I am and of comparing. So don't worry about this. Just know that this conceit is there. Know it when it arises. And if we do meditation practice, the mind becomes more and more peaceful. Then this mana, this conceit, it gets cut off by itself. The mind cuts off conceit by itself. So we practice to know conceit in time and it gets cut off just by itself. The great teachers, the Krubhajans, have taught not to cling to anything, not to have not to have anything at all. One Krubhajan taught to think of oneself as like a, a foot wiping rag, just not to cling to being anything at all. Because if one clings to being anything, this is a cause for suffering to arise. This gives rise to anger and greed. Umpucha taught to put, just put this all down, to put down one, one's views and conceit. And to put it down on the outside is one thing, but on the, on the inside, we may still have this view, these views and conceit. So we practice meditation. We keep cultivating our minds. We practice to control this conceit. And we contemplate that this conceit of uh, comparing as better, equal, or worse, uh, something that we all have. And we can consider if we're better or equal or worse, does this mean that we can stop death? If we're really better than another being, um, does that mean we can stop old age, stop sickness, stop death? 
we see that whether we think we're better, the same, or worse, that all beings have old age, sickness, and death, all the same. So may you contemplate this, may you teach your mind in this way, that really we're all the same in this way, that all beings must age, must sicken, and must die. So we ourselves age, and other beings age. We get sick, other beings get sick. We suffer, other beings suffer. We die, other beings die. So this is something we all have in common. So may you teach the mind in this way. And similarly with the eight worldly winds, we have gain and loss and others have gain and loss. We have praise and blame and so do others. We have uh, fame and disrepute and so do others. And we have pleasure and pain and so do others. And in the end, we all die just the same. We can contemplate that the Lord Buddha is the highest of all the devas and humans. Uh, the Buddha is the highest out of all. There's no one uh, comparable to the Buddha. And the Buddha entered Parinibbana. Uh, and the same with all the enlightened disciples of the Buddha. They've all entered, or from the time of the Buddha, they've all entered Nibbana already. And just like all the great teachers as well, they've either entered Nibbana or are destined to enter Parinibbana. So we see that all conditioned formations all share this quality of instability and impermanence. Whatever it is that comes into being and is uh, uh, fashioned out of conditions, it can't stay that same way all the time. It must degrade. So we consider that whether we have a little or a lot, we must die all the same. We're all the same in this way. And we see that when after one dies, what's left, one gives up everything when one's die when one dies, and what's left over. So we practice to cut off conceit, to cut off the sense of self. And when views and conceit arise, we contemplate that death is for sure. This can bring our mind to ease and peace. And then when the mind is at ease, we look at the breath coming in and out and bring the mind to collectedness. We consider that we must die for sure, that all conditioned things are impermanent. And these four elements of earth, air, fire, and water must degrade and pass away. We reflect on the not beautiful nature of the body, the asuba nature of the body, and see that the body must degrade and pass away. It's not a me, not a mind, not a self. So you may, may you contemplate this, that death is for sure. Bring the mind to a state of ease and peace. A mind that's not involved, not wrapped up with any of the things of this world. And bring to mind that after death, uh, what's left? Uh, nothing's left. In this whole world, we leave everything behind. Whatever we think we own, we leave it behind at death. It's just simply our wholesome and unwholesome actions that follow us. So we contemplate this. We see the qualities of the Buddha, the qualities of the, the great teachers who have advised and taught us. And these great teachers are something that is incredibly difficult to encounter in this world. And we consider the two types of beings that are hard to find. One is the being who is grateful, and the other is the being that who knows a debt of gratitude and repays that debt of gratitude. One who has uh, kindness and compassion in this way. So we feel this way, we feel gratitude and a wish to pay back our um, or to pay back what's been given to us, or return uh, gifts that have been given. And we see the qualities of the Buddha, the qualities of the great teachers, and we practice Dhamma as a homage to them. And this is a great, uh, 
a great offering, a gesture of respect, a gesture of homage. And we practice to follow their teachings. We practice to develop in the world and develop in Dhamma because we found something that's very difficult to find in the world. So we have this opportunity to practice and follow these uh, teachings. And we practice to pay homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha with our meditation practice. We contemplate and we practice to cut off all views and conceit, all sense of self, and reflect that we must die in the end. We see, for example, uh, Venerable Sariputta, the chief right-hand disciple of the Buddha, uh, foremost in wisdom, who had an uh, incredibly high degree of wisdom. And there was one other enlightened disciple of the Buddha who was renowned as a uh, great teacher, uh, one who could explain the Dhamma very lucidly. And Venerable Sariputta went to go seek out this, this individual and Sariputta praised this, uh, this Sawaka, this disciple of the Buddha, and gave great praise to him. So you can see Venerable Sariputta was one with no views or conceit. He had cut them off already. Uh, Venerable Sariputta was one with incredible wisdom, known as the marshal of the Dhamma. And he had no views or conceit left in him. So we see that life is unstable and impermanent. And these views and conceit can't help us. They can't stop old age, can't stop sickness, can't stop death. So we practice to train our hearts to contemplate in this way. And then we can uh, reflect uh, when it's the birthday of one of our great teachers, one of our great teachers who have given us uh, help helpful teachings. We feel gratitude for that individual. And so we, we express this gratitude. And this is a great blessing, a highest blessing in our life. And this is something that's very beautiful to do. So we practice, we're uh, humble, we pay homage with our Dhamma practice. We follow the path of sila, samadhi, and panya and bring this quality of samadhi to be firm in our minds and contemplate all phenomena as not self and do this all the time. And sometimes we're able to see clearly this is up to the level of collectedness in our minds. So if the mind just has a little bit of samadhi, we'll see clearly just a little bit. And if the mind has a lot of samadhi, then we'll see clearly a lot. We'll see clearly very deeply. And sometimes we see clearly, sometimes not. But don't worry about this. Never mind about this. Just keep practicing. See all dhammas, all materiality, all mentality as unstable, impermanent. Not a me, not a mine, not a you, not a yours. See that attachment is the cause for suffering. The mind with wisdom is able to cut off attachment and realize the state of not suffering. So see this, that all dhammas, whatever the phenomena is, just don't cling to it, don't attach. And see that all the ways to bring the mind to peace, these are all the samatha kamatanas and the mind object of vipassana practice of clear seeing is anicca, dukkha, anatta, impermanence, stress, and not self. And we practice to restrain our behavior of body and speech within the bounds of sila. We practice dana. This is the mind that gives and sacrifices. This is the path of dana, sila, bhavana. We can also say sila, samadhi, panya, uh, giving virtue and meditation or virtue, collectedness, and wisdom. This is keeping the mind in the middle, restraining the mind from following after likes and dislikes. So do this, develop the mind in this way. And this can bring the mind to be a beautiful being, a kalyana chana. And this 
uh, beauty increases more and more. This goodness and brightness increases more and more. And when, what is this goodness? This is one who has practiced well, practiced correctly. This is something that's very beautiful. This is merit arising. This is the correct way. And this uh, beauty and goodness arises due to Dhamma practice. And then the mind uh, is the Dhamma. This is the arising of a Savaka, an enlightened disciple in the heart. We see the Dhamma in our hearts clearly. And this is seeing the Buddha. This is a uh, Sangho, the Sangha arising. We call this uh, the Buddha, a Savaka Buddha, an awakened, enlightened disciple. So may you practice and train your hearts in this way. May you have effort in this. May you chant the praises of the Buddha beginning with it to be so and have mindfulness with this. You can also just chant Sama Sambudo or just Bhuto. But if you just chant Bhuto only and the mind is thinking a lot, then just Bhuto is not enough because the mind is too distracted. So in this case, uh, chant a longer a uh, phrase such as the entire praises of the Buddha, beginning with itipiso, or if the mind is more peaceful, you can just chant, for instance, arahang sama sambudo. And as the mind becomes more still, then you can chant shorter and shorter phrases. And when the mind is even more still and not proliferating, then there's no need to chant anymore at all. So whether one chants 108 times the Tibiso chant, um, the goal of all this chanting, the goal is to bring the mind to peace and stillness. So we can chant Tibiso 108 times or even many rounds of this, and we bring the mind to stillness, to samadhi. Then knowing arises. We know the nature of reality clearly, know the nature of Dhamma, for instance, uh, many years ago, when I was a younger monk, I contemplated a corpse during an autopsy. Could see the the doctors taking out the brain, taking out the intestines, the liver, uh, and all the various organs, and seeing all the blood flow out of the corpse, and just seeing that this body is something that just gets thrown out in the end, and all these various organs. Once they were done weighing them and measuring them, they just all gathered them all together in the stomach and just uh, threw them all together in the stomach without any organization and just sewed up uh, the skin, sewed up the body. So this was just for the purpose of having the organs not fall out of the skin, just to sew it up like this. And then putting cloth over the corpse the mind started to proliferate and to see that life is something that's unstable, impermanent. We all must die and these bodies degrade and pass away. Uh, previous to reflecting on this, uh, I would cling to the head as something high and something to be respected and cling to the body in this way. But seeing the doctors just cut open the head and weigh the, the brain and weigh the parts of the body, I saw that really there's nothing of value there at all. And this give, gave rise to great dispassion in the heart, a feeling of weariness and dispassion. And when the mind started to proliferate that, oh, this corpse is this person or that person, then mindfulness could know in time that actually there's no one there at all. So this is mindfulness teaching that really there's no one there. It's not anything. It's just the four elements, uh, earth, air, fire, and water, having degraded and passed away already. And with the arising of this knowing, the mind became very bright and clear. And walking about and seeing uh, living humans I saw them all as just like machines, just like robots, seeing that really there's no one there. 
There's no self there at all. This is the Dhamma arising. The Dhamma that arises from the mind that's at peace. And seeing the Dhamma clearly like this gives rise to such a great feeling of fullness, rapture, and bliss in the heart. This comes from seeing the Dhamma. So we practice restraint in sila, restraining our body and speech first. We practice to not speak in a harsh way, in a coarse way, or in a useless way, because this simply leads to agitation and chaos. We see nowadays using the phone a lot, whether speaking on the phone or sending messages or looking at social media like uh, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, or Line. And this is uh, within the realm of restraint of body and speech all the same. This falls within the realm of sila of body and speech all the same. We see that if individuals engage with social media in an unskillful way outside the bounds of sila, this can lead to incredible suffering and pain uh, for those that uh, engage in social media like this. So we see that problems arise like this without sila. People communicate in ways that go against sila and suffering is the result. So we must be careful, have well-established virtue, have restraint in our body and speech to be within the bounds of sila. And this is a foundation to bring our minds to peace and stillness, which leads us to cut off conceit and views. We see the body is ever passing away and degrading. This is the mental object of vipassana practice. And if we can't see this clearly, then we simply come back to our chanting, chanting it to be so, restraining our minds. So may you do this all the time. May you do this every day. Do this constantly. And finally, in the end, you'll understand clearly. The mind will gather together in samadhi, and you can see clearly the way, uh, the way things are, see clearly the Dhamma. So may you do this, uh, practice this way, have effort in this. And when the fruits of practice arise, it's not our job, it's not up to us. What our job is, is to water the tree, uh, give it fertilizer, protect it from uh, pests and insects, and take care of the tree, take care of the soil. And the growth of the tree, the arising of flowers and fruits, this is the job of the tree. This is up to the tree. It's not up to us when the tree bears fruit. So our job is just to take care of the tree, which we do our best to have effort in, to do the path of sila, samadhi, and panya, to do this consistently, to have giving and virtue as, uh, as our normal state of being, as firmly established in the mind to have our virtue be firm, which leads our samadhi, our mental collectedness, to be firm as well. And this is the foundation for wisdom to arise. So practice in this way, do this. And finally, wisdom will arise. We'll see the Dhamma clearly. And in this way, doubts will be completely dispelled from our minds. There'll be no doubts left. So practice in this way, train in this way, then the fruits of practice will arise. The mind will gather together, see clearly impermanence, stress and not self. See that in reality, it's all just convention. The body is not mine, not I, never was. So may you have strength and energy in your practice and do this a lot. In this way, your collectedness, your samadhi will get better. Your wisdom will improve. The path of sila, samadhi, and panya will gather together and you'll see clearly and dispel all doubts from your heart. So keep practicing in this way. And the seeing clearly, this is up to the energy and strength of the path in the mind. So we do this 
to see clearly as the mind clings to phenomena, as the mind clings to sense impressions, then we teach our mind right there that all sense impressions are impermanent and un unstable, not anything worth clinging to. And with this clear seeing and teaching the mind effectively, the mind becomes very at ease and at peace. So may you have effort and energy in your Dhamma practice. May you all have effort and uh, be intent in your practice of Dhamma.